Okay, so we're going to start uh, our webinar today, or BR webinar, with a, a presentation concerning deep learning. This uh, webinar will be performed by uh, our friend uh, Stefano Melacci from the University of Siena in Italy. He did that last year, and that's a very important update to everybody expects every year. So we ask uh, Stefano to do redo it and of course update it. And um, I just had a since it's a special day today, you see the title change a little bit. I propose deep learning love, but he said no. We keep on to to the one I I propose. So uh, Stefano, that's yours and. Um, yeah, thanks, Serge. Yeah. Now, I do not see something going on with my presentation. I don't know what. No, I do. I do not see it. I s I oh, here, here we go. Here we go. Did you see it? Yeah, I saw it uh, as a small um, place. No, it it's okay. Yeah. Everybody can see it and click it. Click on the image to see it bigger. Oh, okay, so it, we just oh, have to right. click. OK, so that's if everybody clicks on the presentation, then I we'll can see stop it. and share it again. Perhaps it will. It will. No, 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 it, it, it's, it's perfect. perfect. Okay. OK, so OK, that's fine. Thanks. Go for it, Stefano, and then we'll Thank have you. a question. Thank you. Thanks, Serge. Thanks for this for this kind invitation. And yes, it's, it's a pleasure for me to to be here uh, again <laughs> this year uh, to still talk about what's what's happened basically in the past uh, of the uh, uh, what happened in the context of the research and machine learning uh, in the industry, all that has to do with this big development of AI of the last years and what's what is expected to happen in the next few years. Um, before we start, um, as uh, you know, the first part of this of this uh, presentation is about sort of it's a big story basically that I will try to to tell you. And uh, it also it is related to my personal experience, of course, it's my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, I sort of had a pretty uh, curvy path in the context of st still in the context of machine learning. Uh, since I started to to be fascinated by, by machine learning and AI as a student, uh, I've been working as a researcher in the, in the academy. Then I moved to the industry for some years and I had the opportunity to still experience with uh, with machine learning also in the context of industry. It's, it's not the same thing as in the academy, as you can guess. Uh, then I went back to the academy uh, and I became a professor. Uh, so, you know, I sort of had the, the, the pleasure and the, the opportunity to see uh, both the faces of both the sides of the moon, basically, the academy, the industry. And this helped me at least to, to develop a uh, personal and pretty open view uh, on, on what's going on with, with machine learning. Okay, um, where, where, where do I work? Uh, as Serge already, already said, uh, I work at the University of Siena. Uh, the group, the, the research group in which I'm involved is, uh, is part of the so-called SciLab, Siena Artificial Intelligence Lab. So here you can find a link if you like, and you can, you can just have a look at who we are and what we do if you need just, just more detail. Uh, and uh, from the picture, you can see that we are a pretty a significant amount of people, I would say, uh, all you know, that are all sharing this, this big interest in, the, in, in machine learning. OK, as I already anticipated, there are three main parts in this. There are multiple parts in this presentation, three of them mostly. The first one is about telling you what happened in the last 20 years of uh, research in the context of machine learning. It would be very fast, of course. We cannot talk about everything, but it would be, I think, pretty. Uh, we go straight to the point that I want to make in the following parts of this presentation, uh, where in which I will tell you uh, where we are now and what what's my opinion about what's going will 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 be going on in the next few years. Um, Okay, let's start with the first part of this presentation. So let's talk about the past. You see the, the title of this is past and present of deep learning now what? So this is about the past. Uh, and what I would like to, to tell you uh, starts about 20 years ago. So we are around years 2000. Uh, and uh, these years uh, were, were pretty, uh, I would say very different from, from what you see now uh, about machine learning since uh, talking about machine learning or AI was very, very, uh, was something that was not so so common with 
uh, casual people that you might meet on the, on the street. Uh, and uh, the industry uh, was not really, was not strongly pushing uh, solutions based on, on AI. So uh, it was machine learning, AI were really sounding like uh, topics that were just for a few people, a few people really interested into them, not much more than that. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think you can get the, the overall feeling. And in this presentation, I will strongly make a reference to the Gartner hype cycle. You know, Gartner is, is a very important research and advisory company uh, that provides information and tools and estimates on what's about uh, technology. Uh, so you see uh, the Gartner type cycle is something as you see here in, the, in this picture. So there is there is a, there are a number of trends, a number of topics that uh, are depicted on this curve. The curve goes up at the beginning and then it goes down again before reaching a plateau. So that's what happens. Uh, as long as time passes, you you have a new technology, it goes very up in terms of visibility and hype, then it goes down and then it reaches a plateau of productivity. Uh, in, in early 2000, the, this, this Gartner curve was not talking about machine learning or AI. Uh, if you see the, the keywords that are on this in this graph, they're about uh, Java language or Bluetooth or uh, I don't know, as uh, wireless, web. So pretty different from, from the one that I will be showing uh, in, in a few slides, because in, in, the, in the first years of 2000, the attention of, of everybody was completely focused on, on, on the web, on search engines, on semantic web, and more generally, web technologies. You know, these are the years of the rise of Google, so the web was really everything, and everybody was looking for opportunities, business and research opportunities uh, in the context of, of web. Uh, related uh, things. Uh, so data mining was really something that was really uh, stimulating the interest of, of, several, of several people. Um, if we try to look what was happening in the context of machine learning, so what machine learning researchers were doing those years, of course they were studying a lot of applications related to, to, to the web, but in terms of uh, foundational things, everything was about kernel methods. There was a big, big interest in, in methods that are built on kernel functions uh, and support vector machines are the, the most common ones. So everybody was really focused into this. Uh, most of the people, I would say, not everybody. Um, you have to think that the, the data sets that people were using at that time were pretty, pretty small compared to nowadays standards. So we're really talking about a few hundreds of, of examples or a few thousands in, in some cases. Uh, so. Uh, everything was small scaled, if you look at it with nowadays eyes, uh, and kernel methods were performing pretty well. However, kernel methods, you know, they did, uh, they do need to, to sort of memorize examples. And uh, there were some obvious scalability issues on the long run that were going to, to take place. But it was not something that many people were, were fearing because data was, was pretty small at that time. So everything was about learning functions composed of combinations of, of a kernel function that was selected before, before running the, uh, the, the, the experiment. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of the most common keyword in uh, machine learning papers of the time was maximum margin. So strongly, strongly related to what was common in support vector machines. So the idea was of separating data belonging to two classes. You see the picture here, data of class A is blue, data of class B is green. And you have this separating hyperplane in red that is in the middle between the two classes. It's, it maximizes the margin. And this, of course, not only in the case of a linear uh, separating surface, but also in the case of a nonlinear function. So that's where kernel methods were providing uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, important uh, contributes. Um, so everything was really focused into this, this, this aspects. And this was strongly paired with the idea of convexity. So people were studying problems that were convex. So problems with uh, basically just a single equilibrium point, a single stationary point. So no local minima, no saddle points, problems that were yeah, I, I'm going to say easy to optimize. They're not so, so easy in general, but they are easier than other problems that are not convex. So everybody was looking for convex formulations of problems. 
uh, and uh, something that was not convex was really looked with with sort of um, I don't know uh, not with a very positive positive mood. Uh, people were strongly studying theoretical properties of the problems that they were facing. And you see it here a snapshot from a paper taken from, from a conference of the time, it's just a screenshot, just to tell you that there was a lot of emphasis in theoretically grounding an idea before reaching the, the, uh, uh, the experimental uh, practice. Uh, and this was of course very important, it is very important. At that time it was strongly, strongly stressed. Um, so what about neural networks? Neural networks today are very popular, but what about early 2000s? They were very, very well known. Uh, they were inspiring, fascinating, I would say, uh, but they were not like the mainstream thing to, to follow uh, just because the optimization problem that was, was needed to be solved in order to train a neural network uh, was, and it is not convex. So it was not in the flavor of what I presented a few slides ago. Um, so um, neural networks were not like the mainstream, even if there were tasks in which they were considered to be more appropriate than kernel methods, uh, in speech recognition, online learning, you know, neural networks basically did not depend, with a few exceptions, on the, uh, on, on the number of examples that were used to, to train the, uh, the, the network itself. Uh, so the shape of the function was not really, the, the number of parameters or learnable parameters was not depending on the number of training examples. So, you know, they were, even if this was a nice property, they were not mainstream. Everything was about kernel methods. In the case, let's, if we look at something that is was, it's more close to application, uh, let's consider the case of natural language. Um, in this case, there was a lot of emphasis on unsupervised learning. People were trying to discover semantics from big collections of, of documents or of text data in general. Uh, so many keywords that were circulating at that time were latent semantics, topic modeling, uh, all was really about trying to discover regularities in documents, something that was uh, sort of uh, trying to discover the importance of each word inside each document of the collection and, and, and also uh, vice versa, how strongly each document was related to, uh, to words. Computer vision was uh, really, really um, based on features, on low-level features that were not the outcome of, of machine learning. Uh, people were using features that were just, you know, uh, uh, the outcome of very good intuitions uh, to represent small patches of the images. SIFT was not one of the most widely known one. Uh, and there was no learning behind the way these features were defined. Uh, and uh, uh, a challenging issue for that time was really speed. I mean, it's, it's always a challenging issue, but at that time the computational power was not so big, so uh, there was a lot of attention in uh, how things were really implemented, just to trying to push implementations to, to uh, the best that people, that people could, uh, because of course computers were not the ones of, of today. Uh, and uh, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, for what's about software, software libraries for machine learning, uh, people were not using big tools that you see nowadays. Uh, people were using LibSVM, was not one of the most popular libraries in the context of support vector machines. And MATLAB started to circulate in the community in a more effective manner. MATLAB was very, very good because it was allowing researcher, perhaps there is one microphone open, I don't know if, if if you can, can close it. Um, and uh, um, MATLAB allowed people to actually handle data I.O. very efficiently, visualization, you could plot stuff very efficiently. It was easier to debug code. However, writing down things on a lower level was still very, very, very common. So C and C++ were, were very widely used at that time. I was writing down my code in, in C at that time. Um, and uh, because, as I said, people was trying, were trying to push the implementations to, to, the, to, the, to the best they could. Uh, and uh, it was very common to still share code uh, that was written from scratch without really depending on many other, other libraries. And as I already anticipated, hardware was not really, you know, the, nothing compared to what you see uh, today. Um, and processors were single core. 
uh, RAM was was very uh, the, the amount of available memory was pretty low. Uh, we are compared to today's standards, so we are ranging to a few megabytes to a small amount of gigabytes, one or two in the <clears throat> in the most expensive cases. And there were no there was no emphasis on GPUs because GPUs were not uh, there yet in the sense of not something that can be customized as we do nowadays. So it was complicated to deal with, with, with uh, research in machine learning. If we go ahead by, by six years, we reach, well, more than that. I mean, if we fall inside the range 2006 and 2010, roughly, something started to change. Because at that time, uh, the research community uh, started to gain expertise. Uh, the experimental results of the previous years opened to more uh, interesting and more advanced applications, especially in the case of computer vision. And some researchers started to push the uh, new ideas that became then the basis of, of deep learning. I mean, in these years, it was not like everybody was talking about deep learning. Deep learning was, was starting to, uh, you know, to be born at that time, but was not like the most popular thing. Um, and the industry was still not investing so strongly into machine learning, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, so things were changing, even if not in a too extreme manner compared to five years earlier. And if we check the Gartner curves, the hype cycles of emerging technologies, uh, the one on the left is from years 2006, the one on the right is from years to, to year 2010, uh, I tried to highlight some 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 applications that in a way or another were exploiting machine learning, like speech recognition, speech to text translation, even if not like as you see today, but there was something there. Also video search, autonomous vehicles, gesture recognition, uh, virtual assistants. So some applications in which some people started to really apply machine learning efficiently were, were in this curve, but it was still not about, really not about machine learning. All the other keywords here are about technologies that uh, are not related much to machine learning at all. So again, something was changing, but not in a too extreme manner. Let's look again at what the, the machine learning community was doing. Um, at that time, there were two very important topics. One was statistical relational learning, uh, and one was semi-supervised learning. Um, I think that especially the second one, semi-supervised learning, was uh, really considered to be one of the most natural learning settings because it's the setting in which data, uh, not all the data are supervised and most of them are not, as it is pretty realistic in, in our uh, daily experience in which we are not continuously supervised by, by somebody. And this was really a very important learning setting. So people were trying to do the most they could with data that was not supervised. Uh, and it was different from what was happening a few years before in which semi-supervised learning was, was not so popular, not so, not so common. So a lot of attention to data that was not necessarily supervised. And some, some, some first attempts were following this, this direction to, uh, to basically create the groundings of, of deep learning. So at that time, people started to talk about deep belief network, deep Boltzmann machines. You have all the references here. This is just to say that they were uh, machine learning models in which uh, the idea of learning many representations out of the input data started to become popular. And this was paired with the idea of working in a, an unsupervised manner at the beginning, and then to just use supervisions to, to fine tune the model, just to, you know, to, to improve it a little bit. So again, supervision was not everything. And there was a lot of attention to data that was not supervised. But moreover, there was also the attempt of building hierarchies of, of representations. Uh, following this, this trend, also convolutional neural networks that today are so popular uh, and that were already there since many years before, they started to become popular again. Um, and because again, machines started to become more powerful and people could experience something more with convolutional networks. And they understood that stacking layers of this uh, convolutional models could, could lead to very, very impressive results. 
Uh, and uh, while a few years before, people were saying like, oh no, it's, it's too complex, it requires too much data, I don't know, it's not the best thing to do. I mean, there were many question marks. So things becomes to, to, to play in favor of convolutional networks because of more computing power, bigger data sets. Uh, if we look at computer vision uh, specifically, um, one of the most common competitions at that time was the, the, the Pascal Bach VOC, uh, Visual Object Challenge. Uh, and even if convolutional networks started to become more popular, these competitions were still faced with a lot of engineering and features and not really pushing convolutional networks. Uh, it was very popular to deal with part-based models, so models in which people were trying to uh, to decide how the parts of an object were related to, to, to the object itself. Uh, there were a lot of low-level features that were designed from, from scratch, not learned from data. So you see two, two different, two different uh, trends. On one hand, machine learning was becoming more popular also in the design of lower-level representations, like the ones obtained by convolutional networks, but still people were not really uh, familiar with, with them, not, you know, so familiar to really push them into a competition. Uh, MATLAB became even more, more popular. Uh, I would say that it became one of the, the standard thing to use. People started to share their code with MATLAB. Uh, so no more C++ implementation or C. Well, there was, there was still, still something, of course, I'm, I'm just talking about the most common, common, common things. Researchers started to share code written in, in, uh, in MATLAB. Um, anyhow, even if people were using MATLAB, everybody was writing down its own code, basically. There was not like a unique library for machine learning used by everybody. Uh, I also was writing down my scripts from scratch. This was very time consuming. Uh, and uh, uh, important, uh, another important thing that was happening in those years was that CPUs were improving, they were faster, multiple cores, the overall amount of uh, available memory was bigger than before, so it was very common to have machines with three or four gigabytes of, of RAM, that was doable at the time, uh, and uh, uh, CPUs were still the most common, common processing units that were used to run machine learning experiments. Uh, new players started to, uh, to, to appear in this, uh, in this game. Uh, so smartphones, advanced smartphones, iPhone and, and also others. So also uh, in the industry, there was a lot of attention to what you could do on, on devices that could really be uh, you know, together with, with all of us. Uh, the third shift that I have to talk about in this presentation in this for what's, what's about the past, it's what happened in from 2010 and 2015. That's where deep learning became, became reality. Uh, as I said, the ideas of deep learning were already circulating a few years before, but in these years, I would say they were, they became extremely popular everywhere. Uh, the keyword deep learning started to be popular and uh, these are the years in which the industry really uh, started to, to put uh, its attention to, to machine learning. Uh, some, some things that happened in these years where the, you know, the, uh, Google uh, started to open it, basically the Google Brain project, and Google also, also uh, acquired DeepMind that uh, was all about uh, machine learning. So the industry was really understanding that machine learning was something that could touch projects over a broad set of topics uh, different uh, technologies, and they decided to invest into this. Um, if we have a look at the Gartner curve again, so the one on the left is from July 2011, the one on the right is from 2015. So you see that the one on the left is similar to one that I already presented before. The one on the right is different because you see that I highlighted in red a keyword that is machine learning. So machine learning is there, is on top of the curve, on top of the height. So you see that it's not only about an application, not only about a precise technology. We're really talking about machine learning into this 
this curve. So it became de facto something that was really, really uh, important from the point of view, not only of a small group of researchers, but also from the industry and of people that were trying to design technology in general. In the context of research, we observed blazing results due to deep learning technologies. And these are the years in which neural networks are really back. As I said, uh, in the years before, people were really more familiar with kernel methods. But in this, in this, uh, in this range of years, neural networks became the most important machine learning solution, the most uh, widely used. So the three people behind uh, the, the rise of deep learning are Joshua Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, and Jan Likan. Uh, and uh, I mean, they have been strongly awarded for this in the last years. Uh, they, they really uh, had the uh, nice intuition or of pushing ideas that were already there in the previous years, but now they became something that could be really uh, applied given the uh, computational power that was available, uh, given the size of the data set that were starting to circulate. They basically had the big, big uh, role of making machine learning popular uh, on, on a broad variety of, of, the, of contexts. And there were some uh, outstanding results in different applications. In speech recognition, deep learning basically made a big, big jump in terms of accuracy. And uh, uh, you see also the, the, from the picture that this was also something that people pushed uh, because in those years, the Android operating system started to circulate. Uh, and uh, as I said, smartphones became a concrete reality. So there was a lot of interest into having very strong speech recognition technologies because it was something that was expected to play an important role with, with smartphones. Uh, and uh, deep learning was behind this, this improvement. In the case of computer vision, there was one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, uh, bre important breakthroughs of, of deep learning. Because in 2012, there was a paper written by Alex Kliszewski and, and other authors, Ila Sassiver and Jeffrey Hinton, uh, at New Rips, at NIPS, at that time was called uh, NIPS, uh, and uh, uh, in which basically they, they used a deep network in an image classification problem with 1,000 classes, and they were able to beat all the other uh, competitors. And uh, as you see from this picture, uh, you if you just have a look at the first two bars, uh, the yellow bar was the, the best competitor coming from the previous year, while the second bar is about the network proposed with the network based on deep learning. There was a big improvement. So they, this was the result that uh, told people to stop designing features from scratch by hand because it was possible to learn features from, from data. It was now possible. And this was yielding outstanding results. Uh, in the following uh, years, so you see there are other bars in this graph, uh, all the winning, uh, all the approaches that were able to win uh, this uh, image uh, recognition, this object recognition competition, were all based on deep learning. So this was really uh, 2012, the years in which people from computer vision switched from designing features from scratch by hand, switched from feature engineering to uh, complete uh, uh, machine learning based solution. Uh, and uh, the competition I was talking about was called, and it is called ImageNet. Uh, it was very, it is very popular because uh, well, ImageNet is, is actually not, strictly speaking, the name of the competition. It's the name uh, of, of a big uh, database of images uh, that was created by crowdsourcing. So you see, for the first time, there was a big attempt to exploit crowdsourcing solution to collect supervisions, basically, to ask people to label a huge number of pictures according to the WordNet taxonomy. Uh, and this way, uh, the people from, from Stanford, basically, they got a huge amount of supervised data that a portion of this data was used in a competition that was called Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. And this is the competition I was talking about in the previous slide. So ImageNet was a big milestone uh, because this was really something that allowed to build a big data set if we want to make a very trivial description of this. 
uh, that allowed researchers to play with machine learning uh, using supervised data that was way, way bigger than what was available up, up to, to this year. Uh, but it was not only about computer vision. Uh, at the time, also language started to, to change the way it was, it was treated by researcher. So uh, machine translation that was commonly solved with <coughs> still, you know, statistical approaches with a lot of carefully uh, designed technologies. Uh, this, uh, these solutions were completely, uh, I would say, replaced by uh, machine learning pipelines uh, based on sequence to sequence learning. So the idea of providing a sequence, let's say, of words to the machine uh, and ask the machine to generate a new sequence of words uh, that it's basically the original sentence, the original sequence translated into a new language. So it was really possible to go from a sentence in language A to a sentence in language B with a machine learning based solution. So the machine was able to learn from pairs of sentence, which was the uh, criterion, which was the uh, process to apply to translate the former, uh, the sentence in the formal language into the, the one in the latter language. So these were really outstanding because I, I had some friends working on statistical machine learning. For years, they have been fighting to improve a little bit the results in some benchmark just with a few, uh, a few uh, decimals. Uh, but then when some machine learning sequence to sequence based solutions came out, they really, they went, uh, they, they obtained results that were way, way better than what they, they could get in the last, uh, with a lot of attention in the last year. So this was really outstanding also in the case of language. Uh, just because people, this also favored the, the, the complete transition from feature engineering to end-to-end -end learning. So basically the idea of end-to-end -end learning is just to uh, have some data, provide the data to a neural network-based solution uh, and learn what should be predicted uh, over this data by giving the network uh, some, some supervisions. So you basically provide input-output to the network and you ask the network to do all the job uh, with very uh, smaller attention to the data preprocessing stage, the feature engineering stage that were extremely popular in the first year. So, uh, I mean, uh, it was very, very common to take the data, preprocess it, extract some features, and only afterwards to, to uh, ask neural networks to do something. Now it was, things become very, very uh, easier to do because people were just providing data to the network as it is, asking the network to learn out of it. Uh, these yield to very strong improvements in, uh, in several, several tasks. Natural language processing was, uh, was one of them because there is this paper you see here from the title, Natural Language Processing Almost from Scratch, in which the author basically told people, hey, you know what, instead of using hand-designed features, we can just learn how to process language from the data as it is, asking the network to do everything. And this was really outstanding. However, there are some question marks that we have to, to put on the table that are connected to, to, to the second part of this presentation. Uh, so uh, you remember, I, when I was talking about early 2000, I said there was a lot of emphasis on exploiting unsupervised data. Uh, however, the biggest results of deep learning of years from 2010 and 2015, they were all about supervised learning. So all about data that was completely supervised. Uh, so you can immediately start to, to understand uh, how the attention, uh, how the, the effort uh, in designing machine learning solution uh, is briefly switching from the neural network design to the data collection uh, part, basically. Uh, and this was really, um, you know, something that was uh, not strongly highlighted in these years, but it was the reality. Reality was that in many real world cases, it was not and it is not so straightforward to get so many supervised examples. Uh, but at that time, it was so attractive to get outstanding results using deep learning that people didn't really focus a lot on this problem and they really focused on beating benchmarks that were already there. In terms of software, uh, that's another revolution that happened in these years. 
the software that we use today started to circulate in those years. I'm talking about TensorFlow, uh, Torch, and then of course PyTorch is just you know an evolution of this, or Theano that then I mean, it was stopped, but Keras or Cafe. These are all libraries that um, basically made it easy to develop machine learning solution, also using graphic processing using uh, units. Sorry, also using GPUs, also using video cards to perform computation. So this is another revolution because, as I said, in the past people were, were basically writing everything almost from scratch. Now people started to, to rely on the same set of libraries, uh, and this really accelerated the development of uh, machine learning solutions, especially because these libraries, some of them, were able to automatically compute the gradients of a certain cost function with respect to some parameters. In the past, I mean, we were all writing down this the gradient computation from scratch, and we were introducing mistakes. It was really error prone. It was really taking an insane amount of time. These software libraries started to, to, to tell basically researchers, hey, you know what? You can avoid implementing the gradient computation. I can give you something that can compute gradient for you automatically. This really improved the reduced the time was taken to develop machine learning based solution. As I said, uh, graphic processing units were reality because in these years, the prices of video cards that were able to customize the, the computations, uh, those prices went down. Uh, NVIDIA pushed the idea of the CUDA toolkit, the CUDA language, as a language to write down code for, for uh, their own uh, graphic processing units, for their own video cards. Uh, and uh, it was still uh, tough to write code this way because you had to basically convert your code from, for example, your initial implementation to the CUDA version. But if you were using the software libraries I mentioned in the previous slide, this was not was basically made transparent to the programmer. Uh, and that was a big revolution because it allows to reduce, as I said, the uh, development time, but it also increased the, the, the running time of the experiments. Sorry, it reduced, of course, the running times. I mean, there were big speed ups in terms of time. Making computations using video cards, using GPUs was, and it is way more faster than doing it on, on CPU in, in, in some very common uh, cases, because there is a big, big degree of parallelism that, that you can reach. So that's another hardware revolution of those years. Let's switch five years uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the relative future. So we are between 2015 and 2019. These are the years in which machine learning was really everywhere. Uh, because these are the years, as you see from the slides of settlement of deep learning, these are the years in which uh, the industry started to invest insane amount of money into machine learning. Uh, the industry was already investing a few years before, but now we are really talking about insane amount of money. Uh, venture capitalists started to understand the value of uh, machine learning startups, so they really uh, started to focus a lot on this. And these are the years in which it was possible to, to say something about AI also to casual people, uh, just because there were, they started to circulate many uh, mobile phone based applications uh, based on machine learning, based on AI, like, you know, you see the pictures here. Uh, it's from one of those applications that, that, that change your, uh, that can change your face to the, to the one of, of uh, an adult, of an older person, or you know, the one of, of a kid. Uh, and, people understood that these applications are based on AI. So AI was a keyword that was really uh, circulating in a very, very efficient manner, also to people that were not in the field. Um, and uh, since 2017, uh, you see that in the Gartner curve of emerging technologies, there is also not only the keyword machine learning, but also the keyword deep learning. So, this makes even more evident was uh, what I already anticipated before. So deep learning was was really there. They are both together with machine learning on top of the of the curve. So instead of just talking generically about machine learning, uh, people started also to focus on the keyword deep learning alone. Uh, in the context of research, so if you look at this from the eyes of a researcher, in these years there is a huge 
explosion of deep learning papers. Uh, and um, as I said, software libraries for machine learning helped a lot to make uh, experimentation easy, very easy and very fast to do. Uh, so everybody was doing something in a very fast manner. Um, and there were a lot of papers that were presenting practical results in which people were picking up benchmarks, doing something with some neural networks. They were getting some better results and, and that's it. Uh, and these are the years in which also technical reports uh, without any peer review started to circulate a lot using the archive platform as, as it happens today, I mean. There is a huge number of papers. There was a huge number of papers circulating. In the case of computer vision, I'm just going quick on this. Uh, some object recognizers started to become extremely powerful, like you know, mask RCNN, uh, faster RCNN, and and also in the case of uh, another very popular application is YOLO. Another popular module is YOLO. Uh, so computer vision really became something that was able to give results that, uh, that, that, that were outstanding, recognizing uh, not only the category of a picture, but also recognizing objects inside the picture, detecting them, localizing them, and also the boundaries of, of uh, entities that, that are in the picture. Something that five years ago was harder to, to imagine at this level. Natural language also improved a lot it became popular to use the so-called attention model. I'm not going much into this, but it started to, to become popular, the idea of having a machine learning model that was also able to decide which portion of the input was more important than others in order to, to take a final decision. And in, in uh, neural machine translation, so in sequence to sequence learning, this became really, really, really powerful. So better results than before, oops, also in, uh, in natural language. And these also yielded to the so-called transformers architecture that are very popular today, that are strongly built on the idea of, of, of attention. Uh, and uh, uh, these models are clear examples in which, you, in which uh, different, uh, I would say, building blocks stacked together were able to give uh, nice results in several applications by, by pushing the idea of, of attention. So I would say in these years, uh, these are years in which results started to improve again uh, because people really, everybody was really doing deep learning. Um, these are the years in which uh, virtual assistants became way, way more, more popular. So, I mean, today we have a lot of virtual assistants we can use, uh, different, different brands are pushing their own. But the point is this, in these years, those assistants were exploiting also neural networks in some cases. Uh, not only for speech recognition, but also for language representation. And this improved several uh, results, uh, even if these assistants were, and also today are mostly able just to, you know, to answer to, to comments, to, to react to, to comments. Uh, some other outstanding results of those, of those years were about caption generation. You give an image to the network, to the system, and you get back a textual description out of it. That's outstanding from the point of view of a technology, generating a caption automatically. Uh, and neural networks were really playing the, this, this, uh, uh, the, the, a major role in, in this application. Just to go quick on this list of technologies, another common keyword in machine learning today is generative adversarial networks, the so-called GANs. Um, neural networks that are able to learn by, you know, by fighting with each other in the sense that there is a network that tries to, to classify, let's say, uh, good examples with respect to uh, against the fake ones, and then in other neural networks that tries to generate fake examples to fool the first network. That's very, very interesting, a very interesting battle out of which very powerful data generator can be created. And this yielded to the so-called image-to-image translation processes in which uh, you know, you, you could go from the picture of a sketch to a real portrait, so a neural network can translate a portrait, uh, sorry, a sketch into a portrait, or it can remove the background, or it can do crazy stuff going from one image to another one. It can convert the picture of a male into the one of a female, and so on and so forth. And these are also the years of outstanding results of reinforcement learning, 
um, Google, uh, Google's AlphaGo uh, solution was able to beat the world champion in the Go game. Uh, that uh, it's, it's a very complicated game from my point of view. I'm not good at playing with it. Uh, but it was one of those games when I was a student, they were, uh, you know, uh, promoted as examples in which artificial intelligence was, was failing. Uh, in those years, uh, machine learning, in particular reinforcement learning based solutions uh, were developed that were able to beat a human into this game. This was really, really, really impressive. Uh, and, you know, also uh, neural networks that that are processing graphs started to become popular. Actually, they are proposed by, you know, by a colleague of mine. Uh, and uh, they are today, they are extremely, extremely popular. So neural networks could really process graphs efficiently. Uh, this was already there since many years before, but it started to become popular in, in, uh, in the last five, six years. Um, However, also some issues started to become popular, some issues that are about neural networks. Uh, these are the years of the rise of adversarial machine learning and all that is about uh, knowledge about attacking machine learning based solutions. Um, people started to understand something that from one point of view, from the point of view of as a researcher was pretty obvious, uh, but not stressed so much, I would say. Uh, so a neural network can, can correctly rec recognize the picture of a bus, as you see here, there's a school bus. Uh, however, if you just change the picture a little bit, changing the colors of the pixels in a way that is not visible by a human, this can make the network create prediction, generate predictions that has nothing to do, that have nothing to do with, with the school bus. So the school bus at a certain point is predicted to be, I don't know, an animal or a cat or, or whatever. Uh, this is really, from one point of view, is a bit scary, but it's, it's, it's really an issue with, with neural networks. Uh, and uh, this started to become common in, in those years. Uh, neural networks and machine learning, they, they have limits. So let's switch to the present. What is nowadays that we have out of, of this uh, big, big background of history? Um, that's basically the second part of, of my presentation. It's, it's, you know, it's shorter than the previous part. Um, what we have today, if, if we look outside, is that now the industry has not to be convinced about the quality of machine learning and AI. Uh, it's, it's mature enough to perceive machine learning as an opportunity and also to invest. Now it's everything, it's, it's also uh, very well understood by, by, by the industry, all it is about machine learning. Uh, and machine learning, AI, that are very familiar keywords for casual people. Uh, it was already happening a few years before, but uh, what I'm, I brought down in this slide is actually a comment from, from one year ago, but it's, uh, it does still uh, does make sense. Uh, when I turned on the TV show, there was a very popular uh, TV show in Italy, uh, and uh, uh, one day was talking about machine learning. I mean, uh, it has nothing to do with technology or machine learning in particular. So it was crazy. I mean, uh, machine learning was really something that was touching also uh, the, the general audience uh, in a very, very uh, deep way. So that if we take a look at the emerging technology curve, the one from the previous year, but I will show you the updated one in the next slide, uh, you see that there are many keywords that are about AI. You see embedded AI, explainable AI, responsible AI, AI augmented development, uh, adaptive machine learning. So there is really something, a lot of stuff about machine learning. If you remember, when I started to show you this picture at the beginning of this presentation, uh, there were no keywords about AI or machine learning. Now, if you see how many of them I highlighted here, you see that things are really different. But what is more and more different is that now we have a curve that is specifically about artificial intelligence. So not only AI, it's part of the curve that is about emerging technologies, but now in the Gartner is providing a, a specific curve that is only for AI. Uh, here you see the one from the previous year, and I updated it with the one from, from this year. Uh, there are many technologies. I didn't highlight any of them in particular, uh, but 
you can just see something pretty, pretty, um, I don't know, if you try to compare the two curves, there are some differences, not so many, I would say. Okay, so I would say that trends have not changed much in the last year. Of course, something evolved, but not in a crazy way. I mean, these two curves are not so, so different. If we look at research uh, nowadays, what is happening is that we have an insane number of scientific papers that are circulating. They are circulating as uh, papers at popular conferences, less popular conferences, technical reports on archive, code on GitHub, strong things that from you know things that are circulating on on social networks in a crazy manner this picture was showing the graph with the number of submissions at the new rips conference uh, and you see the trend is has been increasing in the last uh, four or five years uh, in a crazy manner uh, and the number of submissions went went from 3k to 9k in in three four years here and it is still increasing uh, that's something that is tough to manage. Okay, also for researchers, you cannot follow everything. You cannot uh, easily also check and review this insane amount of paper. Um, but that's what is happening out of, of you know, if, if you just look outside. Uh, as I said, the industry now is mature enough to perceive machine learning as an opportunity, as a something that can be applied with, with good results. We, uh, our lab was collaborating with, is collaborating with a company that is in the field of oil and gas. So not really something that, you know, is specifically about machine learning. And we published a paper last year uh, in which we have been using machine learning to detect defects on X-rays of, of uh, turbine blades. So you have this big X-ray images and our solutions are able to find, to find small defects uh, in, in these pictures, uh, drilling defects, so defects that are created by humans when, when creating these turbine blades. Something that is very hard to see by uh, just by looking at the pictures, the machine was, was and is behaving in a very, very uh, nice way. So you see what, what was happening. A company that had nothing to do with machine learning invested into a machine learning based uh, solution with, with good results. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, this, what happened is also uh, the uh, the big companies uh, pushed machine learning to another to another level by applying it to large scale uh, settings. So we have Nvidia, Google, OpenAI, and also others that tried to that, that were able to make popular also some approaches that are very visible from from the outside. When I say visible, I mean Think about generative models in which you change the style of a picture, you create high resolution images by merging features from different pictures. You take different pictures of, of faces and you create a merged version of them. Or you take one picture and you create uh, a new instance of the, that picture by changing the style of, of the appearance of the eyes, like uh, uh, automatic, uh, automatically generated portraits or whatever. This is done at a very high resolution and in a very, very impressive, impressive way. Uh, Google was able to beat results also in the protein folding problem. So it's AlphaFold uh, was the technology that was beating this, this, uh, this, this benchmark at least, providing results in this problem that, you know, I don't have big expertise into this field, but uh, what, I, what I got is that the result was uh, insanely uh, higher than all that you got from you could get with with previous technologies. Uh, that's that was outstanding. In the context of language, we saw the the popularity of big language models like GPT-3. But today there is also Megatron from from uh, Nvidia and related uh, related researchers uh, models that are able to generate language that looks like created by a human. So what you see in the picture is something I took from, uh, I think it was the, uh, the, the uh, an article from the Guardian newspaper. It was created by a language model based on a neural network with uh, 175 billions of parameters. And this text is talking about AI. Uh, it looks like written by a human. It's, it's perfect from the point of view of syntax, of grammar. The meaning is okay. It's very, very convincing. 
So machines are able to generate text that looks like written by, by a human. Uh, other impressive results, like the one from Dal E from, from OpenAI, uh, it's a model that can create a picture that resembles something that you can specify with, with language. So you see here this picture, the user wrote an armchair in the shape of an avocado, uh, and the machine generated those pictures. Uh, so the machine was able to create a picture that is the visual description of something that was written uh, using, using language. That's another outstanding result obtained by massive, uh, by mm, processing a uh, huge amount of, of data. Um, however, all these technologies, uh, they, they actually, uh, they are not something that can be considered to be energy efficient in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, they, they are, these solutions are trained on huge collections of GPUs that are exploiting a huge amount of power. Uh, so power means money and, you know, potential issues to the environment. So these solutions are definitely not energy efficient. So let's start to, you know, to, to highlight something that is not so okay. Uh, I'm switching in my presentation to, to, uh, to, you know, from presenting something extreme, extraordinary to highlighting issues. So energy is one of them. Another one is that neural networks are black boxes. They tell you what's the prediction of the network, but they don't tell you why. Uh, that's another problem. How can you trust a neural network prediction if you don't understand why the network made that prediction? Um, then the question that one should, should ask is, uh, do this machine understand as we do as, human, as humans? Well, the answer is no, not at all. Uh, these machines, they have their own notion of understanding that is not the one that we have as humans. They are great manipulators or indexers, if you want, of data. They can really take big bunches of data and do their best to learn out of them, to reproduce that behavior that the human is showing to the machine by giving examples. But they are just trying to find the best solution in terms of, you know, of what they can. They are not trying to find the best solution for a human. Um, so these crazy results that we have been observing, uh, they should not be interpreted as results that are basically um, allowing researchers to build machines that can completely replace human, that can understand as a human do. No, in some tasks, they can do better than humans in some very, very vertical task, very, very precise task, but in general, they don't have, they are black boxes. They don't have a notion of understanding. Uh, so they are very, very good indexers, manipulators of data, good workers, but not like they do not act like humans. Um, and you can immediately understand that, uh, I can skip also this because there is a picture that I want to emphasize. Okay, this one. Uh, the, the problem that we are facing today is that <clears throat> researchers move to, exploitment of big networks trained over huge collections of data. More data, more data, more supervised data usually, not always, but usually, more and more. So collecting this data takes a lot of time and energies. So we are really shifting the problem from the neural network to the problem of collecting the data. And let me talk about this picture. Uh, you know, I took it, you see all the, the credits here in this picture, I didn't do it. Uh, it was drawn by an uh, 11 years old uh, child. Uh, and um, this picture is basically showing us that this, uh, uh, these monkeys that uh, are, are trying to reach the moon. They, their goal is to reach the moon. And you see that there are some monkeys that they started to look in the water to see, hey, you know, we can see the, the moon in the water. So the best thing to do in order to reach the moon is to jump inside the water. Some other monkeys are climbing over this tree. Uh, and every time that they can go higher, they say, oh, you know, we are closer to the moon, so we are getting better. Then another monkey jumps into a higher tree and the monkey, the monkey says, okay, I'm even getting better, I'm higher. Uh, there is another monkey that is trying to build a balloon just to, to, to travel and say, you know, I'm higher than trees, so I'm better than you are. 
Then there is a monkey in, in the ground that is trying to build a spaceship. The monkey is not moving any steps toward the, the moon. And the other, the other monkeys are, getting, are making jokes uh, out, out of it, you know, because this monkey is building a spaceship but not moving from, from Earth. So, you know, uh, all the other monkeys feel, feel better than, than the one that is building the spaceship. So today, what, is, what we are observing in machine learning is that we are climbing on higher trees, but we will never reach the moon this way because the problem of collecting data and dealing with data is there. The problem of energy efficiency is there and we cannot ignore it. Some other problems uh, is that there is, if you remember, when I started this presentation, I told you when people were studying kernel machines, kernel machines were, they were also paying a lot of attention to theory, uh, to the motivation behind their, their proposals. Today, this is less frequent. I mean, people are just trying to do something. And when they see they were motivated by nice intuitions, perhaps, but it's just, you know, you have an intuition, you try, it works, that's fine. This is okay, you know, but, you know, we are really, I think we are moving too far away from really understanding a problem from a very low level point of view. We are more trying to do in order to reach the result as faster as we can. And we are not really studying things in detail. That's another problem. And the popularity of software libraries is on one hand helping a lot. On the other hand, is also shadowing uh, a lot of lower level elements from, from people that, that are starting. So if you are starting to play with machine learning, you start with one of those very good software libraries that are basically hiding a lot of things to you. So you feel immediately good at doing something, but you don't really know what's happening. And this is a problem because machine learning is not like uh, uh, something that is always deterministic, clear, perfect. I mean, machine learning involves optimization, non-deterministic procedures sometimes. It involves data. Data is noisy. Data, you know, it could be big collections, small collections of data. So in order to, deal, to really master a machine learning solution, you have to go down to the details. Uh, and uh, um, we really need to study problems from a very low level point of view. This is not always happening nowadays. We have a big issue when I say we, I mean also in the, in the academy, with education. Because on one hand, we have people that, you know, in, with a very small amount of time can follow a tutorial based on deep learning, take some data, follow the tutorial, and I don't know, classify images or classify language or do something like this. And it's hard to convince them that a real world problem is different because uh, everybody is just taking data that is already there, collected by somebody else. Everybody is using supervisions that are already there, collected by somebody else. Everybody is playing on a sandbox that is very small. But when you face a new problem, this sandbox is not there anymore. And if you have not understood the low level details of what you do, you're not able to solve this problem. This picture is just a funny, it's just a joke. I mean, you see this, this, this child is saying, you know, I want to implement a semantic labeler using transpose convolution. And the teacher is saying, okay, you don't even know what a convolution is. You know, how can you think to, uh, to, to, to be able to do that? Uh, but the child is basically ignoring the teacher and say, okay, well, anyhow, let, let's, let's talk about something different. What is a validation set? I, I don't care. I mean, that's the problem. We have to convince people, to educate people, to look at the details because nowadays it looks too easy to reach the, the end of, of a problem, uh, but it is only possible in very small sandboxes, not in the real world. Um, and yeah, that, that's what I just said. So basically, we basically have to find a trade-off between opportunities and the capability of exploiting them. Uh, that's a trade-off that we have to, to master today. But now, the reason I went quick on this is that I wanted to reach the last part of this presentation, the, the now what part. So you saw what happened in the past, you saw what is machine learning today, but now what can we do? Um, of course, uh, following up my last comments, uh, we, 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 we as teachers, we have a big role in educating people in understanding the details of, of what we do. Uh, so one of the things that is in that educators should do is this, uh, let people understand the details, not just how to run some code. That's the first thing that, that we have to consider in the future. 
The second thing is that going back to the picture, we, we are in the condition in which we really need to build this spaceship. So we have to stop climbing trees. We have to accept that we can design new solutions that are not so good. Well, they are good, but not state of the art in existing benchmarks, but they can, they will allow us to move one step further. So it's like we have to make one step back to make three steps further if you want. Uh, we have to stop focusing on benchmarks, on existing benchmarks. We really have to think about the new models that can allow us to go up because uh, we cannot keep climbing on trees. You know, we have been reaching the top of most of the trees in our forest, so it's not something that can work. We really need to build uh, our, our spaceship. The research community now is open to this. Up to some years ago, it was not like that uh, because everybody was just attracted by quick and fast results from, from deep learning. Now things are different. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, the, the research community is ready to do this. Now, something different from over, over the last year, so this is really fresh stuff, some interesting trends I wanted to mention um, is that uh, at the last uh, uh, Neo Rips conference, is the most popular conference for machine learning, uh, there was a workshop, it was called Data Centric AI, um, that is basically focusing uh, the attention of people uh, to how data is treated. Uh, this is basically remarking the issue that I raised some slides ago, the issue with data. We have a big problem with data. We have to learn solutions that are data, we have to design solutions that are data efficient, that can work also in a small data regime, that can work with a few supervised examples. Uh, data that can really do the best with also devices that are not like big clusters of GPU, GPUs. We have to really rethink machine learning, having our look on the way we handle data. At the same time, at the ICML conference, another one of the most common conference in machine learning, international conference on machine learning, there was a tutorial on continual learning with deep architectures, continual learning. So this is really pushing the idea of considering data, not as something that is already on your desk when you sit down, not something that is already on your hard drive if you want, not something that you collected before. Data is something that keeps uh, that keep arriving, I mean, in your application, your machine learning solution should be able to react to the data at the time in which it is provided, at the time in which it is collected. Imagine to have a camera that is getting data from, from a certain, I don't know, uh, scene, visual scene. Uh, every time that some data is acquired, you want your machine learning solution to react to that data, to make predictions, and also to learn out of it. So learning, predicting, they take time at the same time and uh, they, they, say they take time jointly, they happen jointly, and they should progress over time. Machine learning solutions should evolve, should adapt, should improve over time. While machine learning people mostly, most of them, they think about solutions that are trained with the classic statistical assumptions in which you have a data set, you train on the data set, and then you deploy your solution that is not learning anymore. That's, that's something that should change, that must change, because we want machine learning solution that can continuously learn over time. So in order to make the most out of data, so you see data, continual learning, these two things are strongly related. And at that workshop, I actually published a paper. Uh, here you just see the title. Well, that's a screenshot of, of the presentation I gave. If you follow this link, you, you can also find the, the video. Uh, it's a two minutes video, so it's very fast. The paper I published together with some colleagues of mine is this one is can machines learn to see without visual, visual database it's basis sorry can machines learn not because you provide a database in advance but just because the machine keeps learning over time reacting to the data adapting to the data uh, and also supervisions is something that arrived over time the time at which something happens it's important uh, so time does matter that's a very important point that uh, will play an important role in the next years. Uh, we don't learn from shuffled frames. We just look at something. We learn because there is a continuity in what we see. If we shuffle uh, what we are observing, can we still learn? Uh, and another important thing is that 
time is not an iteration index. Uh, many people consider time as an index. It's like, you know, uh, we have a sequence, the first element of the sequence, then the second, the third, this is an index. It's not like that. Something happens at a precise time. The something new happens at another uh, time. And the time that passed between these two events is important. There is information there. So this is just to tell you that in my opinion, of course, that's my opinion, what's, what's happening now and what, should, what, what will happen in the next few years uh, is that there will be a lot of attention to something that learns in a lifelong manner, continuously over time to make the most out of the data. And uh, there are some questions that I actually uh, wrote in that paper I mentioned uh, and that I reported here. Let me just have a look at them. Uh, that are challenges for modern machine learning community. Should we focus on the role of time and motion to design algorithms that better leverage the data? Can we design agents based on the online processing of the visual information uh, that sporadically interact in a human-like manner? So instead of having a big data set completely supervised, we have data that arrives over time. Sometimes we get an interaction with a human. Sometimes we don't. We need machines that are able to react to this. Um, and can we stop thinking about something that is trained before and then deployed, then tested? No. Can we think about that keeps learning for its whole life? These are the agents that we should look for. And this basically triggers back something that people uh, underestimated for, for some years, the importance of unsupervised learning, because most of the data that we get is unsupervised. We need solutions that are able to do a lot out of this data. There is a lot of information there. So uh, what will happen in the next few years is not only uh, using, uh, you know, not only uh, learning in a lifelong manner, as I said, doing the best out of the data. And when I say this, I also mean learning the best that you can in an unsupervised manner. When you have supervision, that's good, but this cannot take place every time. So a lot of emphasis to unsupervised learning. Of course, this triggers a number of other topics like how interactions uh, take place with humans. Uh, and you can also think about agents that not only interact with humans, but that talk, that interacts by, with, with another virtual agent. So a machine learning based solution could learn from another one. Uh, so uh, we have to create solutions that are able to communicate to learn from the context in which they live. So again, uh, the role of data, the role of the environment that was already stressed, for example, by reinforcement learning, it's something that will play an important role in the next years. Uh, and this adaptability that I already stressed when talking about continual learning, it's something that will, will, you know, will, will be will more and more important because we don't want a machine learning solution that works very well in a benchmark, then you move it to the real world and it's not so good anymore or and you have to, to adapt it, but you don't know how. So we need something that can adapt itself, that can continuously learn. Uh, another piece of knowledge I want to put on the table is the fact that uh, <clears throat> there's this big emphasis on end-to-end -end learning uh, actually uh, made a lot of people pay less attention to knowledge when represented in a symbolic manner. Uh, you think you all know what a database is. You can think about what a, a graph, a knowledge graph is. I mean, there is a lot of knowledge that is not of, in the form of, uh, you know, uh, input examples as the one we commonly provide to a network. Um, there are big knowledge bases that can be used uh, to, to basically help the network uh, to learn in a more efficient manner from the examples provided by the human. So we have examples given by human, a network, and also other knowledge that is already there, that is the outcome of years of studies in the context of knowledge representation. This world, the world of knowledge representation, knowledge graphs, uh, will marry in a stronger manner, at least that's what I think, of course, uh, neural networks leading to the so-called neurosymbolic learning. It's already there. I think it will increase in the next, in the next years. Uh, there is also an important project that is already going, going on there by some years, the Taylor project on trustworthy explainable AI that is basically putting together a lot of information that has also to do with neurosymbolic learning 
with a lot of attention to what can be explained. As I said, the neural networks have black boxes, while symbolic knowledge is usually something that you can manipulate. If you look at a database and you have a table in which you know that a certain person is in the table of, I don't know what, I mean, of something, you can immediately understand this, okay? While if you get a neural network predictions and you try to understand the motivation of that prediction in terms of products between weights and, and other numbers, you don't get anything out of that. These two words should be fused in order also to, let help, to, to help neural networks to be better explainable. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the last thing I wanted to say is about power consumption. As I said, uh, most machine learning based solutions, some, well, many of them, they are not really green in a strict sense. I mean, they require too much computational power. We want to design solutions that are able to run with a very small, with a smaller amount of computational power, like, I don't know, the one that you can have on a mobile phone or uh, on edge AI devices. Uh, it's still more than what, what we had 20 years ago. It's still way, way more. We can do a lot with that. Uh, and uh, we can reduce the power consumption of machine learning uh, models. Uh, and yeah, uh, the, just, just to conclude, uh, in this long discussion, I mean, we have not only discussed what happened in the last 20 years, we have discussed what is the situation of machine learning today uh, and we started to visualize what are some possible trends for the future. Of course, some trends that I think it will be important, then we will see, okay, nobody has a crystal ball as I anticipated at the beginning of this talk. Uh, but I really think that things are changing uh, and that the machine learning community will really uh, now, have the, now has the opportunity of doing something great, not by following the mainstream direction, but by starting to design new directions, new directions to follow in the, in the next years. And that's really, really challenging, that's complicated, uh, but it's also very stimulating, uh, you know, at least from the point of view of, of a researcher uh, in this field. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That, that's, this was my last slide. Thank you, and I'm here for, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Stefano, for this, uh... Uh, synthesis this presentation uh, passionating like last year like you did as usual i would say um well i have a, a question which is continuing the the one i asked you last year um you said that one of the sure. key dimension of the future of deep learning and ai is explainable ai that was yeah. uh, one of the not the black box etc and last year you talk about maybe hybrid solutions uh, looking at the future to introduce explainability into AI. So like the gold, good old fashioned AI with rules, with a symbolic AI, etc. And do you have any concrete project in that field of hybrid um, AI? Okay, thanks, Sergio. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's still, I mean, it was last year and it is still, I think, a very, a very hot topic. Uh, we have been working last year on this. Uh, I can also provide some some references. I mean, we have some some work into no, this. No, no, that's a... And and but my opinion, I can tell you what, what I think. Uh, I still think this this uh, this direction is very is crucial for for explainable AI and and neural networks because, as I said, I mean this uh, the idea of integrating neural networks and knowledge bases immediately opens to the fact that you can use the structure of the knowledge bases to explain the neural networks. So after one year, I can tell you that this still still holds, in my opinion, this is still very, very hot. Uh, there has been progresses. I didn't see any, you know, any crazy solutions to, to this, but I still think that uh, uh, this direction is not only still there, but it's, I mean, it's uh, followed with even more attention than, than the previous year. Overall, I can tell you that the, the field of explainable AI, it's pretty big. And uh, today I still see, in the last year, I still <coughs> observe of, of variety. I mean, a lot of different approaches, a big, big, uh, big, big field. So there are still tons of attempts to do the best to make neural networks explainable. The one you mentioned, I still think is one of uh, uh, the most promising uh, approaches that you, we can have in this direction. And uh, there is a lot of activity going on in, in this field. 
Okay, thank you very much, Stefano. And maybe you say also during your presentation, um, there were a kind of new problems uh, to be tackled today by uh, deep learning. Uh, could you be more explicit on what you say when talking about new problems? Yeah, yeah, I'm mostly talking about the problems that are related to uh, the, the continual learning perspective. I mean, um, today, most of the, the approaches are, are you know, developed in, a, in an offline manner and only afterwards that are deployed, they are deployed in application. This is somewhat the standard thing. Uh, however, uh, that's, that's, that's not, you know, that's not completely realistic because, for example, I would like to, you know, to, to have my smartphone start uh, record or, or a camera recording something uh, inside my company, my private company, something that I don't want to share with the outside. I want a deep learning or a machine learning model that can learn in that context from scratch. Can I use existing models pre-trained or things like that? Not necessarily. Uh, for example, because I, well, I'm talking about myself, but uh, it's just an example, because perhaps I don't like the fact uh, that uh, I don't know these models with what data they were trained, how they were trained, they've been trained by somebody else, and perhaps that could be backdoor. There are no backdoors, but sorry, I'm just making a, a very silly example. Uh, so the challenges I'm thinking of and the challenges I was talking during my presentations are about the, the capability of designing machine learning solutions that can continuously evolve and adapt over time. We have been studying online learning since so many years, uh, but today there are no solutions that are ready to go, ready to use in the context that I mentioned earlier, in which you have some source of data and you want a machine learning solution that learns out of that source of data with a few interaction continuously. There is not something like that, even if the problem is clear, but neural networks are struggling uh, in this. So this lack of adaptability opens to new challenges. Okay, well, that's very interesting. And in the last year, um, what eventually, um, what, uh, is there any application, a deep learning application in the real world, um, which was um, surprising for you or brandly new? I have a question also on the chat concerning science fiction, eventually something we say, uh, which is called to fictional science, uh, typical, uh, is there any application which is weird, in which uh, you found a very promising um, last year in the area of deep learning? Um, well, that, that's surprising that, for you. That, that, that's, that's, of course, my opinion. In the last year, I was not like insanely surprised by something. I mean, the year before, I saw this big explosion on language that was really triggering my attention. Okay, In the last year, I sort of saw the, the, the overall machine learning community evolving, but I was not like uh, uh, completely captured by, by something new. Uh, that, that's of course my, my opinion, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's what I think. Uh, in, in the year before, uh, 2020 was more uh, interesting from my point of view. Today uh, I felt like things improved, but I was not like triggered by something in particular. Okay. Well, is there any question uh, in the audience, any other question or remark? And what is the major issue personally you're facing today in research in which you're working? Oh, yeah, it's continual learning. Yeah, that's why I was stressing it. Uh, okay. I really like it, the idea of having a system that learns in a lifelong manner, uh, continuously adapting to, to the data and reacting to a few supervisions. I think that's the, that's the challenge that is important in an absolute sense and the one that that I'm trying to, uh, on which I'm trying to, to put energy. Then, then of course, we will see. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And I think uh, there is Thanks. maybe a, a last question. Um, yeah. Do you think we have reached the top of the exponential curve of machine learning, or can we start another curve of growth of machine learning? Okay. Uh, of course, it's, it's hard to say, and it's, it's, it's almost impossible to trace hard the conclusion. But I really feel like uh, the, the, the curve that, that shows the improvements in machine learning and so on in the last year, it has saturated a lot. Now, uh, I don't think that, I, I think it will change its, its slope at a certain point, but not by following those trends that have been mainstream in the last uh, five, six years. 
uh, we have, to, as I said, uh, to switch our attention to new directions and to start playing with them. Also, perhaps uh, accepting the fact that performances might, might get a bit worse in some well-known benchmarks, but trying to do something that can work better uh, on the long run. So, yeah, I feel like we are... Um, I cannot tell you, I cannot say completely saturated, but uh, the, the, this explosion in the field of machine learning, uh, it's less evident than in the previous years. Okay, thank you. There is another question, I think, coming in. Okay, it, it just agree with you. Okay, so nothing else? Thanks, so, I'm glad to know. <laughs> so, Stefano, it was great uh, listening to you today, this year also, and I hope... Um, Next year we'll have the, without the COVID, the opportunity to invite you to to come here and to see uh, the beauty of this area of Biarritz area. Okay, and uh, and of much. course keep on Thanks working for... with you. We have uh, this um, Erasmus Mundus Master Program in the air between uh, Siena, Estia, and Vigo in Spain. We hope it will work. We went through the threshold, so let's see. But I'm quite sure we yes. keep on cooperation in the future. And thank you very much again, Stefano. Good luck. Thank you. And uh, hope to see you soon with pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Serge. Thanks. Bye, okay, everybody. Bye, everybody. And thank you again. Bye-bye. Just to say also that your presentation has been recorded and will be available um, on STI website and Datum Academy website. Okay. So okay. thank you very much. Talk with you soon. And Thanks. Take care. Bye, Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.